everybody. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us for week four of MDA's ALS virtual learning series. My name is Kayla White, and I'm a community education specialist here at MDA. We are so excited to have you join us today for this webinar. This learning series is part of our larger MDA community education programming, which focus on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and resources. Be sure to visit the community education section on mda.org for updates on upcoming events. We are recording today's event and we'll be posting it to the website for on-demand viewing at a later date. Um, please know that all phone lines have been muted, but we will have some questions and answers at the end of the session. So you can use the chat feature to send those questions in as you think of them and we'll get all those addressed at the end. I would also like to thank our webinar supporters, Mitsubishi, Tanabe, Pharma, America, and Cytokinetics. We would not be able to provide community education webinars like this if not for their generous support and we are very thankful and appreciative. For over 70 years, MDA has led the way in accelerating research, advancing care, and advocating for the support of our families. MDA's mission is to empower people living with muscular dystrophy, ALS, and related neuromuscular diseases to live longer, more independent lives. Our mission comes to life through four pillars, care, champion, catalyst, and community. If you haven't done so already, we invite you to join the MDA community by registering with us. So I'd now like to introduce today's guest, Brian Kellenhofer. I'm actually gonna let Brian introduce himself today. Um, so thank you for being here, Brian. The floor is yours, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Kayla. Man, do I need a new profile fo photo. That, uh, that one is, does not do me any justice. So I apologize in advance if I cracked anybody's screens um, by looking at that or if I'm doing that right now. Um, I just wanna thank the Muscular Dystrophy Association specifically Kayla White for reaching out to us. Um, again, we are happy and very honored to be here today. Um, my one thing that I'd like to share is um, whether you're watching this on demand or you're watching this live, um, you are more than welcome to contact myself, our team. I think it's really important and we're doing our job by being a resource to you and your community. So if you have any questions, because I promise you that we are going to cover a lot this evening. Um, so my one request is please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. You certainly have an additional friend in this world. I understand that planning in this space can be quite overwhelming. It can be a little bit, um, well, very time consuming. Uh, so we just wanna be really mindful of that. Very appreciative that you're taking time out of your night to listen to us present. But again, as part of this ALS virtual learning series, I was speaking with Kayla yesterday and she shared with me that it was really important to families that she was getting a lot of questions on financial planning. And <clears throat> excuse me, I think financial planning, it's never the most fun thing to talk about, um, especially also um, in this space. So with that being said, uh, we're, we're gonna try to make something that can be quite overwhelming um, and, and vast um, and, and simplify it. And that's really our intention today. So with that, I'll give a little background on myself as well as our team, but first let me just open up our slide so we're ready to go here. Um, and so again, uh, my name is Brian Kellenhofer. I'm with 1847 Financial, specifically our special needs planning team. Uh, I've been with our firm since 2017 now. Um, a little background on our team specifically. Uh, for almost 20 years, over 15, our team has really specialized in planning for loved ones um, with some level of supplemental needs, whether it's uh, special needs, neuromuscular diseases, um, and again, and what does planning look like in that space? It has been the majority of our practice now for those past 15 years. Um, as well as my uh, goal has really been to expand our team into the uh, mental health space as well. Um, as you can imagine, minimal resources are not necessarily as visible ones, specifically going through um, yes, elementary school, high school, so on and so forth. <clears throat> uh, so with that being said, um, I'm gonna get right to it. Uh, we typically consider our workshops or the terms that we quoted or coined um, being a three-person retirement that would be for if you had a loved one or a dependent um, with supplemental need 
But with that being said, I understand that those attending, um, this is a little more vast, um, not necessarily age specific. So if I don't cover in this workshop what you were hoping to, again, Kayla, please feel free to pass around my information. Um, I, and I'm happy to answer any questions more specifically at, at another time. Um, now with that, again, going back to my conversation with Kayla is really trying to understand what's important to the caregivers and what's important to the family um, as a whole. I think really when you come down to it, it's maintaining lifetime care um, and that idea of quality of life. It is, if I'm not here uh, to care for my loved one, regardless of age, regardless of condition, um, if I wasn't here today, what would it look like for the person in my life who who needs me. Um, and what I can say is, should that happen, it will never look the same, but there are certainly pieces in place that, uh, or things in place that you can put um, to position your family um, to, to be stable and be able to move forward. The last thing we want is, should something like that happen, the, the household, the family to take a step back. I don't think we can put a price tag on peace of mind. This is where we talk much more about the personal or behavioral aspects of finance, right? It doesn't always have to just be return, percentages, stocks, dollars. Um, it can also just be, hey, what let's, what's allows us to, to rest a little easier at night? And I think putting these things in place will do that. Um, again, that peace of mind of when you're no longer able to care for your loved one, um, having that plan in place, understanding what housing might look like, what the government benefits might look like, how to pass down an estate most efficiently, um, protecting and maximizing government benefits. That is a very, very um, important topic that I will be sure to cover as much as possible in our time together. Um, as well as, again, as I mentioned, planning for a three-person retirement should you have a dependent who's going to require or be dependent of your assets in some capacity. Again, that's regardless of government eligibility, that's regardless of diagnosis condition, that is a discussion that a lot of families end up getting very held up on is, um, well, I don't know if this plan really caters to us. And I think the only question that has to be asked before getting too far into the weeds is, do I have a loved one or an individual in my life who is a dependent of my or who is dependent of my resources in any capacity if that answer is yes you are certainly watching uh the right workshop or the, the right uh learning series, virtual learning series now with that we also want to make sure that the assets we're leaving behind to our heirs whether you are the caregiver whether you're a parent um or if you are caring for a child we want to make sure that we're providing equitably and equal i think somebody um, much smarter than me once said fair is not always equal, equal is not always fair. So how do we how do we pay close attention to that when caring for our loved ones? Um, and I think it's fair to say that nobody wants to leave a tip on top to Uncle Sam. Now, I did notice that we do have a few attendees on here live. Um, the one thing I would like to say um, to any of you attending is feel free to throw either the name of your loved one or the age or the household dynamic um, that might allow me to speak more specifically um, on that topic. Um, but with that, if you have individual questions as well, please feel free to throw them in the chat. I'm happy to answer them um, and I'm happy to to address any that anybody might have. So let me just make sure that we all still have and see my slide. Great. Now, the majority of caregivers or dependents um, of a loved one living with muscular dystrophy, um, some level of supplemental need, have not planned sufficiently. And there can be a lot of reasons for that. A lot of families like to think, oh my gosh, it was this large catastrophe or this large event in life. And, you know, I, sometimes I think it's, it's easier said than done, but if you take a step back, life just gets in the way. It doesn't always have to be big things for the reasons that people have not planned sufficiently. Um, just being a parent, and just working, and just doing life, if you will, uh, can, is a full job on full time job onto itself. When are you supposed to make time for for stuff like this? 
especially when it's not necessarily the most exciting thing to talk about. Um, but again, when it comes to from a professional perspective, something that we see quite often is <clears throat> lack of coordination among advisors. And when I say advisors, I really mean professionals in your life. Now, in a typical household, yeah, some of the professionals in your life might be an attorney, an estate attorney, more specifically, an accountant or a CPA, a financial manager um, or a financial advisor, an asset manager, an investment planner, uh, an insurance advisor. <clears throat> and what ends up happening in most households is those individuals will work in silos. And I, if you take one thing away from this workshop, I really hope that it's the understanding and confidence to go work with a specialist, go work with somebody who has having these conversations every single day. You might not like that my last name is pretty hard to pronounce. Uh, you might not like that that profile photo at the beginning of this webinar um, was shoddy at best. Um, but again, what's most important is that you're working with a specialist. You're again, it, I can't I cannot emphasize that enough. Now, with that is if your current advisors are the ones you have, you like their neighbors, their family, their friends, but if they're not experts in special needs planning. Now, what do I mean by that on the estate side? You don't want to work necessarily with an estate planning attorney who's just going to look up how do I put together a third party special needs trust or a first party special needs trust on Google. You want to work with somebody who's having those conversations constantly, who who has it, who's doing workshops like these candidly, who who you can find online and, and see that they're active in, in this community and your community. Um, and I don't necessarily think that maybe on the estate side more, but when it comes to the financial planning, they don't have to be around the corner. Um, I'm doing this workshop from Pennsylvania. I know Kayla is doing it from very far from Pennsylvania. Um, so with that, we just wanna emphasize working with specialists. Um, I think the absence of a plan as well, uh, something that we see quite often is um, avoidance and that's okay. I think it's reasonable. I think it, it happens, um, because again, it's it's intimidating. It's not necessarily um, something that families look forward to is planning for life for a loved one when we're not there. Um, that's pretty natural to not be excited about that. But what I can tell you is um, nobody's ever going to be able to replace you. Um, that will be hard enough. How do we make sure that things are put in place um, so lifestyle um, can at least be maintained to, to the best of our ability? And, and we have the opportunity to do that while we're here. Um, which, if you ask me, is actually very exciting. Now, from a estate plan, financial plan, um, we see a lot of people who kind of set it and forget it. And with that, things change, laws change, um, strategies change, opportunities change. Uh, so we, we see that quite often. We want to be mindful, too, is are we fine-tuning? Are we being reactionary, uh, which we don't necessarily recommend? Or are we kind of being um, and planning-based, for a lack of better terms? Um, now, when we go back to that procrastination, sometimes families will say, oh, we have we don't have the time. We have other priorities or we're going to just wait and see how things play out. Um, what I would say is when it comes to planning in general on the estate side, on the financial side is. It's not in pen. It's not written in stone. You start these things, you gather a base plan um, and you fine tune. Think about it more in uh, in pencil. It, it's funny. So. When I first started doing these workshops, <clears throat> I'm a big like analogy, not analogy, but I'm a pretty big, uh, I won't say, I like to compare things. I like to make things, break them down, make them a little more real world um, for those who attend. And with that, I was trying to compare these workshops to something. And something that I thought of was that these workshops are actually kind of similar to building a home, not necessarily buying one, but building one. What typically ends up happening when families think about buying a home, the first thing to think of is like the furniture <laughs> or what kind of um, what do they want their countertops to look like in the kitchen or do they want a pool when really the first thing you're supposed to do is, is just research the area and make sure that it's where you need to be and where you want to be. And when it comes to planning in this space, I think that first step, that research, that understanding of am I in the right place? Is this where I need to be? is coming onto this workshop, um, either attending live or watching on demand. 
And from there, it's just it's just step by step, right? How do you eat an elephant bit by bit? Um, and you just, you take your time and before you know it, your shoulders start to drop, your breaths become easier. And something that seemed very overwhelming is starting to, you know, really turn into this really pretty picture. Um, so again, I, I just wanted to touch on that because I, I do think it's important that families know, you know, it's one day or day one. Now with that, um, special needs planning can be very difficult for general financial and estate planning. But when it comes to a true special or supplemental needs plan, there's really three main facets. And that's the legal or the estate plan, the government benefits and care management, as well as the financial planning. Now, what you'll notice on this slide is a few things. Um, the first one is that my designations in wealth management, my degrees in finance, that is not to compliment myself. That is just to make crystal clear that it's certainly not art. Um, why do I say that? Because this is a pretty shoddy at best representation of a three person uh, retire or a special needs plan. Now, when it comes to that previous slide, there was an author and there is an author in the financial services industry who talked about the significance of a one page financial plan. Now, with that, what we came to realize and what he came to realize is that a big these big components of financial plans, what ended up happening is people would put a lot of work in clients, families and the professionals into putting these very big, vast financial plans together. And what the client really needed could probably be broken down into one page. So all that um, illustration was is it's a it's a one page, if you will, special needs plan. Now, when it comes to those three facets, going back to it, um, I think the first one to start with is government benefits. Now, there's two kinds of government benefits. There's entitlement based and eligibility based or needs based benefits. The one I'm going to start on first, and then I'll allow this to open up to questions after the uh, presentation is over. And again, anybody watching on demand and not live, uh, please reach out if you do have any questions specifically. But <clears throat> one of the main resources available to a household um, is going to be SSI, um, also known as Supplemental Security Income, and not to overcomplicate, but that is administered by the Social Security Administration. And that is SSI. Um, SSI in 2023, uh, the full benefit is roughly $915 a month. <clears throat> now, what that is, is not just $915 a month to your loved one, but it's also the opportunity to really be opened up to, um, to the system at large, if you will. Now, the only issue is to receive those government benefits, um, your loved one is only going to be able to have $2,000 in their name. $2,000 is not necessarily um, a lot of money. You might pay rent once a month, but again, it's certainly not going to provide a lifetime of care. Um, I do want to make note that at the age of 18, unless your family is uh, poverty level, that is when your child would become eligible for SSI. Uh, there's some inherent benefits for SSI as well. Uh, should your child be or loved one be um, declared by the government as a disabled adult child prior to the age of 26, they will have the opportunity to earn social security based off of their caregiver or parent's social security in retirement. So to just give a um, kind of basic math um, example is mom or dad retires, they're receiving $3,000 a month from Social Security and retirement, their loved one, should they be declared a disabled adult child, will just be eligible to receive 50% of that benefit. Um, so now they've gotten a bump from that $915 of SSI to $1,500 a month of Social Security. Um, as you can imagine, that is much more. Um, it's a great benefit, but there's also gonna be some key considerations for families when they start taking Social Security and retirement, what's gonna be the best benefit for the family, as well as their child. Um, something I do want to preface is government benefits, SSI, should be seen as a floor for your loved one. Think of it as food and shelter. Um, it's not going to maintain the lifestyle 
the fun, everything in between, everything that makes your loved one's world go round um, is not going to be covered by government benefits. Now, what you may be thinking is, okay, $900 a month at 18, when we retire, $1,500 a month, it's still $2,000 resource limit. And you're absolutely right. Um, so what do you do next is you'll typically go to an estate planning attorney, one who specializes uh, in special needs planning um, to get all of your estate work done. Again, we wanna make sure that this is a specialist. There's some verbiage in estate work um, and estate plans that can certainly be very inefficient by somebody who's not experienced. So you just wanna make sure that you're working with the right people. Now, when you go to an estate planning attorney, one who specializes in the special needs space, they'll probably have you create or update wills per my last will and testament. This is who will take care of my loved ones. This is how we will leave things behind. <clears throat> you may also be recommended to get powers of attorneys, uh, both durable and financial powers of attorneys. Uh, so you can speak on your loved one's behalf um, in a financial capacity, but as well as in a physical capacity. And that is typically recommended, at least from what I've seen for anybody in your house older than 18. So if you have a child older, older than 18, um, it might make sense to get powers of attorneys. And then what will also happen, and this is where we tie back to the government benefits, is an attorney may recommend creating a special needs trust. Now, what is a special needs trust? Um, a special needs trust, I think first off, what it is, is it can have zero dollars in it, or it can have $2 million in it, and it will not go against your loved one's eligibility for government benefits. So this is where we start getting very strategic. Your loved one cannot have $2,000 in their name. That does not mean that they can't have more than $2,000 for their benefit. That's just not in their name. So the most efficient way to go about that is by creating a special needs trust. Now, creating that special needs trust is not the be all end all to special needs planning. While it is crucial, um, in the planning component, again, it is not when you're done. Um, again, without a funding strategy, without a properly designed um, funding strategy for that trust, um, all you have is is a very expensive stack of paper. Uh, um, so we want to just be very mindful of that and understand that job is not finished yet. Now, something else that's extremely important is beneficiary designations. Um, it might be one of the most important aspects of planning in this space because we want to make sure that whether it's you as a parent or caregiver, siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, friends, we want to make sure that they're not leaving any assets, whether it's life insurance, retirement plans, cash, homes, we cannot leave those outright to our loved ones. Uh, reason being is they could become quickly ineligible for government benefits, or we're gonna have to get very reactionary um, with those assets to be able to maintain those benefits for your loved one. Um, and again, as I mentioned, special needs planning does not begin and end with having that special needs trust. There is far more to do. And then partially biased because I am a financial advisor um, is the third, and in my opinion, uh, one of the more important, but they really are all equally as important um, facets to this planning, and that's the financial planning component. Now, there are a couple of things that we want to be mindful of. There are a couple of things that I think we answer specifically. The first one being, when do you fund a special needs trust? The second one is with what? And the third is, is who pays for it? Um, now, the first reason, uh, the first question that I think we answer is, when do you fund a special needs trust? When do you start funding um, anything like this for the benefit of your loved one? So a better question, and it's one that's typically um, best answered live, is um, I mean this tongue in cheek and I don't mean to be fresh, but if you have a loved one or a dependent um, <clears throat> with any level of supplemental need um, or in general, is who's going to pay for everything that they want and need uh, while you're still alive? And typically that answer is from parents is, well, we are. So with that being said, you have you are the living, breathing special needs trust. You just happen to go by mom and dad. Um, now, this is a saying for my grandfather, and it might be because of the generation that he was born in in the Great Depression. But 
he always just said that money in your hands is better than money in anybody else's. With that being said, if it was $100,000, if it was a million dollars, it wouldn't matter. If it's in a special needs trust or if it's in your hands, um, it's going to be much easier to spend how you want it um, without limitations in your hands. So when do you typically fund a special needs trust? It's going to be upon your passing. Um, so I hope that makes sense from a when to fund a special needs trust. It would be part of the estate work, part of the beneficiary designations of your assets um, <clears throat> to make sure that we're passing the right assets um, at the right time, which is typically um, upon, upon your passing. Now, with that, we want to talk about when or with what assets do we fund trusts. Uh, so trusts are funded wildly or taxed wildly differently than, than you or I or individuals married filing jointly. To be taxed at the highest federal tax bracket of 37%, a married couple has to earn over $600,000 of income. That's a lot in taxes, but that's a lot of money. Um, <laughs> but with that, a trust, if not funded properly, gets taxed at that level after only $13,000 of income which is not a lot of money, but that's where we go back to being wildly strategic with the assets that we're leaving to these trusts. So as you can imagine, there are some assets that are really efficient and some that are really inefficient to leave to a trust. Um, I'll start with those inefficient ones and we'll kind of work our way up. But as a reminder, we are speaking about taxed at that highest level of income after $13,000 of income. So what assets do we not want to leave behind? Ones that are going to be taxed as income. Um, so what are those assets? Traditional IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, anything that's going to be taxed 100% as income when it's withdrawn. The only issue is that's typically the assets that families are very heavy on. Um, in the middle or in that middle tier, a tax efficiency would be non-retirement investments, um, whether those are stocks, ETFs, mutual funds, but stocks that are just being taxed from a capital gains perspective, as well as real estate. Reason being is there's a step up in cost basis upon your passing. You buy a house, it's worth $400,000. It's now worth $500,000. When you pass away, you leave it to a special needs trust. There's no gain on that $100,000. <clears> And then from a tax efficient standpoint would be the assets that are 100% tax free, those being Roth components, Roth 401ks, Roth IRAs, as well as some form of life insurance, um, in this case, most typically um, permanent life insurance, because it's 100% tax free as a death benefit to the trust. Um, again, I hope that I clarified that. I, I know that that can really, really um, get people's heads spinning. So I apologize in advance if that is you right now. Um, so again, those social security decisions, we wanna be very mindful as caregivers of when do we start taking social security um, <clears throat> because there may be an inherent uh, benefit to our child and we'd always wanna see them have more. Um, so with that, it's just something we wanna be mindful of, something we wanna pay attention to as you go through your own planning, your own retirement planning. Um, approaching investing differently, I'll give this a more um, in context kind of example, but if mom and dad are, are 50 year old, years old, a typical financial advisor would say, oh, you should be in an asset allocation model of 50% stocks, 50% bonds or whatever. Um, <clears throat> if you have assets um, or if you have a loved one who's gonna be dependent on your assets, whether you're here or not, and they may be quite younger than you, then really those assets need to um, be invested more appropriately towards their age. And where's the most, uh, where's the only place that beats inflation, which is the real risk to your, um, your assets, to your loved one, um, is purchasing power. And logically, the only place to beat inflation net of taxes is going to be the stock market. Uh, so we want to be really mindful of how we're investing, that we're making sure that our assets are going to be here much longer than us. Um, because they need to be. <clears throat> On the insurance planning, again, um, whether it's an audit of your personal insurance that you have now, um, or going through the process of, of life insurance, it's a wildly tax efficient way to fund trust. Reason being, again, is that it's 100% tax free debt benefit. Again, does beneficiary designation errors, can't, uh, can't say it enough, but just make sure anybody in your life or in your loved one's life who is looking to leave assets behind, please make sure that it's not outright to the individual. 
um, and then it's more specifically uh, to a trust uh, for the beneficiary or for the benefit of that individual. How much does my loved one need to maintain their lifestyle? It's a question we get quite often. And it's one that I wish I had a more definitive answer to. What I will say is that we do not have a crystal ball. Um, if we did, I think everybody's life would be much easier. Um, but not one size fits all. I think one of the best practices for a family to do is just really start laying out what expenses would look like if you weren't here. So first, maybe start with the functions of daily living that you do or that you assist in. Um, put on top of it housing, transportation, and from there, uh, we can help families walk through the impact of inflation, um, growth in the market, what have you, over the next X amount of years. And we can kind of come to at least a, a relatively good idea of, of what to leave behind. Um, I want to make sure that there aren't any more questions. And don't forget about taxes. Again, that's something that we're going to be really mindful of is leaving the most tax efficient assets to your loved one. Um, so again, there are some very efficient and inefficient assets to leave behind. Always be mindful of it. Happy to walk you through that again. We also do have a proprietary product of uh, or calculator, calculator. It's a special needs planning calculator. It's where we lay out those expenses, inflation, uh, time value of money, um, et cetera. Uh, to help families get a better idea of how much really do we need to leave behind. And we go back to the funding strategy for a special needs trust. Um, some of the more efficient assets could be real estate. It could be non-retirement investments or um, whether that's stock options that you have in a company that you worked for um, or just individual securities, <clears throat> as well as um, Roth components, Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks being 100% tax-free, withdrawn, or again, uh, the life insurance component. Um, for the caregivers specifically, we just wanna be really um, considerate about your own lifetime care needs. Uh, it's very easy as parents to never think about yourself. Uh, but the one thing that we do wanna make sure is that you are never becoming a liability to your family financially, um, to any of your children, um, so with that, we just want to make sure T's are crossed, I's are dotted, make sure that you have the proper uh, insurances in place, life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care, retirement planning in general, just understanding your budget and your cash flow and your needs, um, and how are you currently addressing those risks. <clears throat> now, ABLE accounts, we do get a lot of questions on. Uh, some of these notes are specific to my state of Pennsylvania, um, but I want to really make sure that everybody understands that able accounts are not a replacement for proper financial planning and they are not a um, replacement for <clears throat> a special needs trust now an able account is only for disability related expenses can be paid from it so the tax breaks that you would even get using it again they're not even going to be eligible unless it's for a disability related expense in the state of pennsylvania the maximum Annual funding amount is $16,000. Um, <clears> something that we note is they're very similar to 529 plans or college savings accounts. Um, the investment options are limited. They're usually in pretty expensive mutual funds. <clears throat> we think that there can be better ways to leverage dollars that you're using to put into these kinds of accounts for a greater benefit when it's really needed uh, to fund a trust. Able accounts, but they can be very, um, solid tools if you need like home modifications, um, if you need to pay for a van um, or a, an accessible van, um, again, can be can be an adequate tool. And um, so we just want to always clarify that because people tend to have a lot of questions. So typically what ends up happening, and I did get through this rather quickly, I do believe that we kind of earmarked 45 minutes. Um, <clears throat> but with that, by this point, 35 minutes in, heads are probably spinning. And what you've come to realize is, holy cow, this man just talked for 35 minutes and where do I start? Well, typically, if you hop on these workshops, you're one of two spots is you've done some planning and you're not sure if you've done it adequately or you've done none and you just don't know where to start. And both are just fine places to be. Um, 
if you have questions about financial planning um, with special needs expertise, again, we are not attorneys, we are financial planners. Um, but some of the questions that you wanna ask is, is your current advisor experienced and versed in this level of planning? Are there potential gaps in my plan or inefficiencies? Um, and in my opinion, hopping on Zoom for an hour, whether it's us or whether it's another team that's dedicated to this space, um, it's never not going to be worth your time. And could that second opinion hurt? On the estate planning side, you just want to clarify again, same thing is, is my attorney, is my professional a specialist or are they a dabbler? Are they going on Google um, to figure out how to put this plan together for your family? Uh, do you have confidence in that? When did I last hear from them? Are they just kind of letting things happen and roll? Or are they are they checking in? Are, are they coming to us with new ideas, new strategies, with updates? Um, and am I confident that my plan is done right versus just being done? Because um, again, there's a huge difference between the two. Um, how we can help, this is just a quick plug. Um, our initial conversations are complimentary. Um, again, complimentary of this workshop to those attending today and those attending who um, will watch on demand in their free time. Um, we'll introduce you or I can at least walk you through those three levels or three aspects of financial planning, government benefits, financial planning, and the estate planning side um, with a little more catered to your family specific di uh, dynamic. Um, connect you to additional resources within the community, <clears throat> whether it's government benefits specialists, estate planning attorneys, um, proper funding vehicles, um, educate you on those special needs trust funding options, when to fund them, what assets to leave behind, how do you pay for them? Um, and again, just a comprehensive, and I'm reading this bullet, but a comprehensive objective and fiduciary bound approach. Um, again, we're happy to walk you through through all of it. Um, and again, that's complimentary. It's just an extension of this workshop out of our gratitude uh, to Kayla and MDA. <clears throat> Um, and just to summarize, surround yourself with experienced quality professionals, those who have your best intentions at heart, those who are familiar with the space and who are not dabblers. Um, nobody knows your loved one, your life, your dynamic better than you. Um, guide your professional. Don't just kind of let them steamroll you. Because um, again, every single family, every single dynamic, every single plan is different. Um, and, and really the ones who are going to know that it's going to work best is, is you. Um, when we consider planning in this space, I, I really want to emphasize that it's not bare minimum. We want to really think lifetime care, quality of life, <clears throat> maintaining lifestyle, um, and, and having a true plan versus in just, just moving forward. Um, so with that, I will open this up to um, questions and answers if anybody has any. Kayla, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I'm going to put in the chat, and I'll ask Kayla to maybe send it out as well, um, my email and phone number, just so everybody has it. Uh, feedback is always appreciated. It's also, again, questions, as I mentioned. You have a friend in this world. And definitely one in this space. Uh, so if you do have any questions regarding your family's dynamic, your family's needs specifically, I'm happy to answer. Um, and I'm, I'm here as a resource. So thank you guys very much. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to hang out here for a few minutes. Should anybody have questions? There you are, Kayla. Um, and again, happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. So, first of all, thank you so much for that very helpful information. It can be overwhelming. Um, if anybody in the audience has questions, feel free to type those in the chat. And a few did come in beforehand. And actually, I have one um, just from personal family experience. Um, we recently put a family member into memory care mm -hmm. and getting all of the paperwork and everything in order was just overwhelming. So what what advice would you give or tips would you have for people trying to get all of that paperwork organized beforehand? What can they do proactively? So proactively, um, I would say get surround yourself with the people who are going to be most active in your loved one's life, um, whether it's the individual who's going to be in memory care, but also um, all those who are going to be supporting that person. 
Um, <clears throat> I would say um, high levels of communication. And I also think you can't put a price tag on putting a plan in place while you can. Um, so if anything, um, I think organization of any of the documents you have, uh, a vault or whatever it is, just making sure that everything's kind of in, in a place where um, those who you trust, but also doing the proper estate work, as I mentioned, Kayla, like the um, powers of attorney, stuff like that, so you can speak on that loved one's behalf um, without any delay, um, I think is is crucial. Um, but I think the organization and also um, a learning lesson for, for the caregivers, kind of like, hey, I should really make sure that I do this for myself too. So I, I experience is one of the greatest educators in life. Uh, we all know that, you know, so through, through experiences like that, I mean, Kayla, you just educated six people attending and, and I'm sure many, many more um, who are going to watch this on demand is, okay, let's make sure that we have our stuff in order. So, you know, our loved one isn't, um, you know, struggling to, to, to get those things in place for us. Definitely. It's, it's difficult when you're at the last minute trying to get everything in order. So, okay. Uh, another question that came in was, do I need to worry about estate planning and all of this financial planning if I'm not wealthy? Absolutely. I think, um, it, and that's something, and I appreciate that question um, <clears throat> to the individual who asked it is absolutely because there's, there's still the need of a plan. And I, I really appreciate that question because I forgot to mention it. People, when they think of a state, they think of like, I don't know if it's like the Monopoly games or, or whatever it is, but they think of this very, very vast level of wealth and estate planning, it's it's just, it's legal documents, it's wills, again, it's a, it's a trust that, that still need to be there. Um, so absolutely, and, and they can be done relatively cost efficiently. Um, and that individual, again, please, I, I threw my, email and phone number in the uh, in the chat. So if they'd like to have a discussion a little more uh, personally, happy to. All right, and we've got one more question. Um, I don't see any that have come in in the chat, but if anybody has any, feel free to send those in. Um, somebody had mentioned that sometimes talking about finances is a little bit uncomfortable. So what what are some of the things that you should look for in a financial specialist? Because it is something that, you know, a lot of people don't really want to talk about. Yeah, that's a great question. I, it's a really good one because I, it's one of like the, the focuses to me, at least of how I try to um, just approach and present myself to everyone I work with and everyone I partner with is it, one, it's a level of trust. You got to make sure you trust the person you're working with. You have to like them. I think it's really important. Um, and you have to know and have faith that that they're versed in, uh, and can answer the questions that you have or um, can walk you through and help you resolve any of the issues um, that you have financially. Finance is not a fun thing to talk about. Um, it certainly can be um, overwhelming. It's, it can be private for some people. Um, and when you're looking, what you're looking for, I think is somebody who's uh, gosh, I'm going to butcher the saying, but you have, you know, two ears, one mouth, act accordingly, kind of. So a financial advisor is just not trying to throw things in your face or, or products or what have you and, and who's just listening. Um, and and <clears throat> I will say, I think that gets that becomes pretty clear rather quickly and just in conversation alone. Um, but just somebody you trust, I think, is, is really probably the most important thing. Actually, I think it is. All right, that's great information and advice. Um, I don't see any more questions that have come in. So um, I again want to thank you so much for, for sharing your time with us today, Brian. We, we so appreciate it, um, your expertise and everything you do for the neuromuscular um, disease community. We just thank you so much for being here and we really appreciate it. You got it, Kayla. Thank you very much. Thank you to all those who attended. Thank you, we're gonna watch on demand. Kayla, again, anybody has questions who watch this, please, please, please have them reach out. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. Um, again, I would like to thank our webinar supporters, Cytokinetics and Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America. We would not be able to provide community education webinars like this one if not for their generous support. And we are so thankful and appreciative.
If you're new to MDA and are diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease under MDA's umbrella or are a loved one of someone who's diagnosed, we encourage you to stay engaged with MDA. You can do this by visiting mda.org slash join and completing a short form. Joining is free and we'll keep you up to date on the latest research, educational programs, and supports. We'd love to hear your comments about this webinar. If you have a smartphone, you can open your camera and point it at the QR code on the screen. That'll pop up a web page with a short survey on the webinar. If you don't have a smartphone, once the webinar is over, you'll get an email with the link in, in that email. If anyone has questions after this webinar, please feel free to email them to mdaengage at mdausa.org and we will follow up with you. This concludes week four of the ALS virtual learning series. Thank you so much again, Brian. Thank you everybody for attending and we hope to see you next week for our final week for a caregiver panel discussion. Thank you all, have a good night. Yeah, everyone.